Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is Post ATA, and I'm heading to France today. Yes, Whitetail Rendezvous is migrating over across the pond, and Francesco Formizano is on the show today. And Francesco's from France, but he grew up in Italy, Northern Italy, actually. And he and I met on uh, Instagram. Francesco is a photographer, outdoor photographer, wildlife photographer. And he's a large animal veterinarian. And we connected. And since my eyes are on Europe right now, I want Francesco to come on. And, and we're going to have a conversation about what it's like to hunt in Europe. And he's actually going to ask me some questions. So it's going to be some fun. Francesco, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Pretty happy to be here. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I am well. I got my tea. Oh, yeah. I have my tea as well. So it looks like we're going to have a good time together. So life is good. So just talk about your hunting and the warm up. We came late to hunting. Yeah. What does that mean? Explain that to our listeners. Yeah. So basically, it all started during the years in university. So I was studying to be a veterinarian. That was the period that I was practicing a lot of wildlife photography, especially on the mountains. Because of the photography, I was really passionate, started to be really passionate about the biology of this type of wildlife, the mountain wildlife, especially goat, mountain goats, wild goats. For my thesis, I was interested to do a part of the thesis, maybe full thesis, on wildlife. So I got to know some professors um, that were doing really interesting researches on wildlife. And I got my thesis that uh, was uh, about studying the most frequent pathologies of mountain goats and deers. So, and I was anti-hunting. I was uh, completely against hunting. But because of my thesis, I got to know different people from different backgrounds. Hunters, non-hunters, researchers, doctors, and biologists, all this type. So, and my conception of hunting started to change because I was spending time with these people. And going up to the mountain with a big lands, try to get good shots, get a good photography of these mountain goats, really was like, I have to know everything of these animals because I have to know where they're roaming, where the area, the different cycles of the year. And when I was speaking with hunters, it was like, these people know everything because they are spending all their time, the spare time that they have just on top of the mountains. And I was fascinated with that. So talking with my professors, I started to understand that actually hunting is conservation. So conservation and hunting are kind of the two sides of the same coin. You cannot have conservation by yourself and just hunting by yourself. It's just you have to do the two things are the same aspect of the topic. So I completely changed my mind and I was really near to get my degree, I mean, and I moved to France because one clinic was looking for young vets to do big campaign, a sample campaign for their healthy system check out on pathologies. And, and there I was starting to be an independent adult. And I said, this is a good time to get my license here and start my experience, my way to the hunting world. And that's what how I got my license. Actually, kind of fresh, if you think about that, just 2016, I got my license. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really, really fresh. I have to say that before I was working with hunters in terms of research. Yeah, I did a three years of thesis doing autopsy on more than 1,000 animals to understand what kind of pathologies are around the northwest of Italy. So the alpine environment. And after that, I say, wow, that's now it's my turn. I want to go to the outdoors completely. And I want to, to experience that in the deepest of the way as a hunter as well. But that was, 
a part of it. I mean, I said, I still have to continue to put the photography into what I'm going to do, even if I am a hunter. And that was, I think, the start, the step that brought me to the this project called Altitude and Trails that is on now going Instagram. That's the reason why putting a little bit of a different view of what is hunting is through the message of photography. Whitetail Rendezvous and Stripe Force Energy have joined together. What have they joined together to do? Well, they joined together to help you kick the can. That's right. Strike Force Energy is the fastest growing new energy drink on Amazon today. It's simple. All you do is rip, drip, and sip. That's it. No sugar, no crash, no calories. It gives you the ability to focus and stay in the stand, stay on the hunt all day long without carrying around the can. When I get a sample pack, simply go to strikeforceenergy.com put in wr free and you'll get a four count sample pack from strike force energy you just said a tremendous amount because there you are a non-hunter and when you're scientists you have scientific background but you have an eye for the lens and so you have an eye for composing art because photography is art and then you throw you into the out of doors and you realize that hunters sort of kind of do the whole thing because you hit hardly on the conservation. And without hunters, there is no conservation. Yeah. Because we yes. fund it. Hunters fund conservation and work with the local agencies to help manage the herd. Yeah. And so, one, I salute you and thank you for understanding that relationship because it's very symbiotic. And when you think about it, photographers and the good photographers I know, they are excellent hunters if they choose to be. Now, there's like millions of photographers that will never harvest, kill anything, and that's their choice. But I know a lot of photographers, because I'm a hunter, they gravitate to you because they want to know, okay, when is the best time for the rut, for bull elk breeding season? And I remember yeah. years ago long time ago going to Yellowstone Park and it was lined with big lenses with long lenses yeah. and you had every photographer who was anybody in the whole world they were there because you could be a hundred yards away or less of a bull doing what breeding during the bugle season during the rut yeah. and there's no better place no better laboratory in the world than the Yellowstone Park now you have other places in the world that hold similar traits for that species. What are you studying now? Are you looking for? In terms of photography, you mean? No, in terms of you're doing a project in France on yeah. animals right now. What is that about? I mean, the, my project, uh, it's mainly what I mentioned before, that project called Altitude and Trails, actually. I have to start a little bit before because living in Italy and France, you start to understand that hunting is not that fashionable. There is a lot of people that criticize hunting. There's a lot of people that are really, really tough about that. I mean, they are ready to just launch all types of critics, even without knowing what you do. And that's really, really bad. We have a different, different occasion. I have uh, experienced that some of the vets that I know, because of hunting, they were attacked badly because of anti-hunters. So... My project, actually, well, the main goal of my project is to try to use a powerful tool, that is photography, to tell stories and show that hunting has to be seen with a different perspective, with a different eye. I mean, because I think a part of the problem is that even that we are showing hunting most of the time in not a good way, not because it's a good way, but we are showing to people that don't know hunting. So if we show, for example, that you know, most of the time is a research for a big trophy, most of the time it's just a big animal, they, we don't give the right meaning to these people because they are not in the field. I'm not against the trophy hunting. Actually, it's, it's biologically speaking, you're taking animals that are kind of mature. So they did most of their life cycle. And uh, that's pretty okay in terms of biology. But these people are going to see that just you are going out, taking just a trophy, go back home. And that's all. But no, it's not what is happening. So if we show with photography this kind of thing in a good way, I think it's a good step to tell these people that hunting is not just about killing. 
and just be an assassin in the outdoors. It has a lot of effort being in the outdoor. And, but when I started to be out there, I started to realize that I just, to take and harvest an animal, ask yourself a lot of effort. Not just because you have, if you want to do it in a good way, it means that you have to know the place, you have to wake up early, you have to train with your weapon, just to understand what kind of animal you have to take, you have to follow the animal, you have to study the animal, and then even when you kill it, there's a lot of work if you want to do it in an ethical way. We push the all our tradition in North Italy, we hunt and we eat what we hunt. That means that we prepare the animal, we do all of ourselves. We care about the meat that we bring home and all the family is going to enjoy about this meat. This is going to bring clean meat to the family. It's really important. And there is a lot of satisfaction in doing that because you're doing it in an ethical way. You're doing as exactly as your ancestor did that. So that is the really essential message you want to bring. You're being funded the project you get hired in France? Is this uh, no, work? no. This is like a really personal project. This is a, a project that I founded. So it actually is founded by my myself for the moment. We start to be open for any kind of proposition, proposal, sponsor. So it's growing. It's really fresh. It just started in 2017. So you think about that. It's like it's fresh. It's just a kid project. It's just still to grow up a lot. So for this part of the project, I think for like all other projects in that are it belongs to different categories of the industry. Starting is so tough, it's so difficult, especially economically speaking, but it's a start. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future? True. So what do you do for your real job? The uh, real job, I'm a vet. So I, it's already been 12 years. I'm a power owner of a clinic in the middle of France. So we essentially is a, a work you do on large animals, especially cows, meat, breed it for meat. That makes our winter, uh, fall and winter kind of busy because we assist them for the cow bird. And this cow, they are a little bit problematic in terms of the cow bird for the size of the cow, so for other type of issues. So um, that's most of our work is concentrate is focused on this period of the year where we have a cow bird. So we don't sleep too much. <laughs> the night, we're going to wake up at three o'clock because there's a breeder that call us because the cow is having problems with her calves. But it's okay. After so many years, it gets like is a routinary uh, work. So it's okay. Well, that's great. So photographer getting in the mountains, talking to hunters and then eating the food. You go back and the honey tradition. Now, do you give all your animals that you harvest the last bunch, the last meal? Uh, actually, when I hunt with my friends, they are born like me in the north of Italy. Uh, their families are hunters, so they have a big traditions. I come from a family that no one, any members is a hunter. And I, all my family is from the south. So I'm a little bit, and now I moved to France. So my tradition is a little bit strange because I'm kind of a little bit eclectic. So when I hunt with them, we do that kind of ritual. When I hunt by myself, it's different. I am more into the individual hunt. So actually, when I kill an animal, there is just a moment I spend next to the animal thinking about what happened, thinking about if I'd done the right thing, and then there is the starting of preparing the animal, moving the animal from the spot, maybe moving to next to the car. But essentially I do with my friends because this is their ritual. So mine is a little bit more different as I can say it's a personal ritual because my family actually is starting the hunting tradition. Actually, it's me. So, and I hope that is going to last, is going to continue. Maybe, who knows, my kids in the future. So tell me about the animals that you hunt. In okay. uh, northern Italy. Okay, so in Italy, so, so we are in the northwest Alpine region. It's called Piemonte. And then it's uh, kind of fabulous for mountain hunting. We have uh, chamois, we have red deer, mouflon, roe deer, wild boar. This is essentially the big game. And then we have all sorts of small game like uh, ptarmigan, perdrix black grouse, hare, you have uh, foxes, but that's, everyone knows about that. So a simple game is really interesting. 
I've been on a lot of hunts with my friends, but Shamwa I think is the most fascinating one. Top of the mountains, and the Shamwa is really a, it's an incredible animal. Biologically speaking, for adaptation that it develop on the mountain, even for the type of hunt, I love the, that individual chase, the stalking, especially because in Italy, when they give you a tag, they give you a tag according to a specific category of sex and age. That means that you need to, before, the best that a hunter can do before the hunting season, the mountain, you start to understand his area, start to understand where these animals are and which type of animals he has to harvest when he will receive his tag. That for me, it's really important. It's not like I go out and shoot whatever it is that I hate that. Now, you said with Shemwa, how do you tell the age and the sex? Okay, the age of sex, uh, it's like, it's not about like two and a half, three years. And so it's just about the youngest of the year and then the yearling, and then you go to the adult uh, category. That's it's divided like that. So the age is about, according to these three categories, not that difficult. If you start to know a little bit the species and the morphology, then you have some kind of uh, different insects about how the horns are, how the body moves, how, for example, even according to what kind of period you are in the year, you have some kind of deformed sexuality. So that means that you can find some kind of aspect that you cannot find like in a male or in a female. There's a kind of unique, like for example, that really famous call by the germs, the Bart, that is like the long line on the back of a male with the long hair. That actually is a thing that you can find or those traditionally hat made of male wool. You can find this big, big brush that is taken from the back of a chamois. It's really, really a nice trophy, actually. With mountain goats, the males heavy hair and then they have pantaloons at later in the season. Now, the chamois have, like, pantaloons With on his... their feet, on their leg. The hair comes out and it looks like they're wearing pants. Not really. I mean, on the chamois, it's like the hair difference is from essentially the back and then the, what we call the brush. is just the hair, that the fur that they push you, that to cover the penis. And then you can see during the winter is easy, easy, even if you have a good scope, you can understand for just that character, you can understand that, that one is a male. But typically in winter, that long line of hair that you can find on the back. Essentially, they use that even during the rat season. They push up. So to look bigger, when they have a rival next to them, you can see that all line. It can even reach, yeah, kind of, 30 centimeters along length, I mean. And uh, Shamwa is really fascinating because of uh, the etology. It has a lot of patterns in etology speaking. During the rut, is unbelievable how many different kind of patterns you will see if you are observing Shamwa. There is that really typical chase that they do when the dominant male try to chase the other one. So they run for meters and yeah 100 can do like 200 meters in some seconds just chasing the rival down the mountain and wow those chases was just the most interesting thing to get i mean to photograph but it's really really tough because i always dream about just taking the chase completely in the snow and having all this sparkling snow going everywhere with the chamois yeah one behind the other another one so um, still didn't get that shot, but there is still time to get, try to achieve. Yes, there's still time to get that shot. And just listening to you bringing people, bringing me, bringing my listeners to the mountainside. And folks, Chamwa live on cliffs. They live very yeah. similar to the terrain that mountain goats live on. And they start chasing. They're not just running across the field. They're running up and down cliffs where you and I would have to rope in to scale it. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yeah. That's why you, one of my posts, there was one really recent post, we just published a picture of a chamois, and then we described that kind of things. Because when you look at them, it looks like an antelope, an antelope running on cliffs. So that is kind of amazing. But I was reading this really, really ancient book called The Devil by is an Austrian book that a long time, I think it's like 18 centuries, and was written. 
I don't remember because I cannot pronounce the name really well, so I don't want to get a big mistake here, but you can find it. It's called The Devil. And what really fascinated me is like the description to a novel that what is a chamois? Actually, chamois is a tough animal because it cannot be different. If you imagine where he's living his life, he's on a mountain, and everything is tough from the birth to the whole age. All is just a tough living life. Because the environment is tough, finding the food is tough, the predators are tough, everything is tough. I mean, when I was in the university, all the chamois that I received, most of them, for the autopsy and research, the youngest one developed what is called starvation. So they just didn't have enough food and they just died during the winter. Other types of chamois, they just developed like pneumonia or care to conjunctivitis. And if you think about that, it's just, wow, it's just not just the environment. They have even kind of pathologies. If you are not tough, if you're not a chamois really in shape, you're going to have really tough life there. It's, the selection is high. So there's a big respect towards these animals, especially when you have them. Because when you think about that, it's like there's no way that the chamois can make a mistake. A mistake is going to be traduced in death. Wow, so age recruitment is tough. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And we have some periods of deer and deer, especially now with this kind of change of climate, period where you can see that the population is not going higher. It's just staying on a plateau and it's not developing. And this is, I don't know, called talking with hunters. This is why I, we returned to the topic before the conservation. When hunters start to see that, that they are not happy at all. Because you want a healthy population. You want that the population is under good prosperity period. When you start to see that, you're not happy to go hunt because things are going wrong. Yeah. And sometimes you cannot do much because as can you do about the climate change today? It's, uh, it's tough to deal with that problem. It's a global problem. It's not just a problem you have in an area. So to deal with that problem is really difficult, especially when for example, you have a gamekeeper and you have to find some ways, some, some kind of suggestion for keep the population healthy. It's amazing that Mother Earth, Planet Earth, whatever you want to call it, no matter what we do or don't do, is changing ever so much, but ever so slowly. Yeah. And it takes hundreds of years to see the impact of what happened hundreds of years ago. And that's the one thing about climate change. You can go some places in the country where the ice flow and the ice depth and everything is at record. You're having snow and, and other places, not so much. And the change started a long time ago before anybody was saying, oh, it's this, oh, it's that, oh, it's this, and you're guilty and guilty here, guilty there. And this is my opinion, folks. It's just, if you go back and study the earth, it has been evolving. At one time where I hunt in the upper Midwest for whitetails, there were glaciers. But in some areas, called the Driftless Area, there were no glaciers. And the yeah. Driftless Areas are on both sides of the Mississippi River, uh, where the Mississippi River is, is today. And then all the parts of Wisconsin are just were glaciated. Then you go up north and to Angava Bay region where I've been and seen the eskers and seeing those eskers and those ponds and those rivers, and it was graded. And then when the glaciers receded, it dropped all these rocks and created ridges, which are called eskers. But you think about all that, that happened millions of years ago. And here today, we see just a snapshot of change that was evolving. And when folks get, oh, you're killing too many deer, we're not seeing deer. Well, there's more deer today in the United States and North America than there has been ever. Because back in the day of Daniel Boone, they weren't counting deer. They were eating deer. Yeah. And the buffalo, we know the story of the buffalo. Steve Rinell does a great job in his book, The American Icon, The American Buffalo, telling about that animal and millions of buffalo. And the Indians lived off the buffalo and they came and went. The same thing with the Inuits with the caribou. It's a chain. And people hate changes and they love the label changes. And I'm getting wound up here a little bit. But it's just, we have to adapt. And so that means hunters, we have to adapt, have to adapt to the changes. 
And then we have to look and say, okay, is there, we have a huge problem. I just came back from a seminar put on by Quality Deer Management, and there was a panel about CWD, chronic wasting disease. It messes up at the end, it messes up the brain of deer. And when you think about that, has that been around in prions, P-R-I-O-N-S yep, yep. is the culprit. And how long has prions been in the ground? I don't know. You're yeah, a vet. It's tough to say. Yeah. It's tough to say. I mean, it's not my sector, but it's not easy to understand, actually. But yeah, it's just like what well, all you're saying is uh, like there is a, still a continuous process of adaptation. And maybe why we are experiencing a, a really short period of that. As you said, a snapshot. So, but there is still that kind of adaptation. It's under our highs and these continues to go. Because, for example, I can tell you that when I arrived here, Middle France, it was 2006. And I was happy about that because still have a winter. So I'm from the Alps. So I say, oh, we still have snow here. I love when the landscape is full white. And so we have winter. We have a good temperature, winter temperature. I think this is really important to keep going with a good cycle. The nature is going to regenerate thanks to that kind that period of the year. But now it's really scary. You After 10 years, now I'm experiencing something strange. You know, you have some weeks, you have under two degree, I'm, I'm talking Celsius, and some period, I'm talking about winter, I mean, January, February, that was the most coldy one month. We are like during the day, 10, 12 degrees. That's scary. And the same things about, I mean, going back to your pre question, we are experiencing some a change in pathologies that we see, for example, in cows. Before, we never had those pathologies, and now they're booming up because essentially the population even of the bacteria are changing according to the change that is happening to the environment. So we don't have the same temperature. We don't have the same soil. We don't have the same field. We don't have the same composition of the herd, of the ground. I mean. So that, of course, is going to be a chain. There's going to be a lot of consequences that goes around. So um, what do you do? You try to adapt yourself. For example, me as a doctor, I mean, as an animal doctor, I have to, I find myself sometimes in a situation, I don't know what kind of choice I'm going to take because I know I don't have the weapons to fight that. So I have to adapt myself and find different ways. So that's what I mean, why we are still in continuous adaptation process. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to gohunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for gohunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, gohunt.com insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. And folks, a little different discussion here. One, we're, we're in Europe and we're talking with Francesco that has some different insights. But the biggest thing is it's adaptation. And when we hunt, we have to adapt. We have to adapt to the environmental conditions. We have to adapt to the landscape. Because if you go hunting, I have gone hunting in the fog and I had to sit down because even though I've walked to the same stand 50 times or less or more, I didn't know where I was because my light wouldn't work because it was fog. It was fog in my face. So I had to sit down and just wait till it lifted. I was at 100 yards from my tree stand. Yeah. So I had to adapt or I would have said, Nothing bad would happen, but it's just, you have to stop and just adapt. And talking about adaptation, how did you begin hunting? I know you're out taking pictures, but who mentored you? That's actually most of, if you want to 
go like that, the teaching peer, that kind of introducing moment that you need when you start a new path was done by my friends, actually, because they were hunters. They started a long time ago, a long time before me. Then I moved to France and France, yeah, I have some friends, but they don't, they are not in this kind of industry. So, but as a lot of things I did in my life, I did by myself, I tried to have research, I tried to understand what is the best way, because I like this kind of asking myself if it's a good thing to do, what if I do this one? So you grow doing like that. I think the most of the mentor, if I have to say, is being nature, doing mistakes. Not in shooting. I mean, it's like trying to approach an animal. And when I was a photographer, it was not that difficult approach when you understand the air. Of course, you're using with big lands, but that's not that tough. I don't know why. But when you switch to a hunter, actually, you change completely. And all your senses, I mean, all your instinct thinking has to come out and be perfect. So I remember being the nature so many times. And I remember, yeah, this kind of... Uh, story i could tell you really quick i was chasing a roe deer and it was a male i knew that it was around the hair i was born hunting it was during yeah late spring we started summer already and i said god it's around this area i know that so i started to and i woke up really early to take the most chance of from the situation and was working as a vet before and i did a really bad night so i didn't sleep at all I was there in the morning, trying to find the best situation, trying checking the wind, checking everything. I was perfect, but there the buck was not there. And I swear, I stayed there just observing, and he came out all the time, the same hour. So I say, look, I'm going to try. I was not on a tree stand. I was just really, really on field, on the ground. But my position was really good, and I was concealing really well. I say, okay, come on. I'm going to just stay here and wait for a while. And another voice on my brain said, I think you can get a nap here really fast. I mean, who cares? I mean, it's the long day. I'm going to spend all day here. So, yeah, I just put myself down, put the ball next to me, and I think I spent the most beautiful half an hour of my life just (laughs) sleeping like a bear because I was really tired. And what happened? I just woke up. I think I spent half an hour just laying down. And I woke up, and then suddenly, behind me, I say, I look at me and I, I turn myself and the buck was behind me five meters. And he was like checking on myself. What are you doing here? And I said, oh, the bow was too far away. I said, oh man, he's, he'd be a lot more clever than me. The nap was not allowed. So he came, for, I don't know from where, to check on me and say, what are you doing here? It was like even saying to me, oh, you're supposed to hunt. Well, you do that. So that was a good experience. Like the, nothing is allowed to you when you're in nature. What you have to hunt is totally 100%. You have to be in shape. You have to be, you have to be keen. You have to use all your skills. But that, I was so tired. I said, I have to get a nap. And then I found out the roe deer came really close to me to check what I was that five meters. And look at him. He barked at me and just it went away. But it was a good experience. I came back home and said, wow, I had a good teacher today. Ah, that yeah, was a good spirit. And if you've been hunting for a while, we've all had those experiences. You wake up and especially if you hunt in the snow, you wake up and there's tracks right in front of you and they weren't there when you went to sleep. Then you go, oh, they're in canny knowledge to know, but they're actually checking you out because there's yeah. no threat. This is a topic for a different time, but we're predators. And so when we're sleeping, we're neutral when we're hunting we're positive predator and we do it with our eyes and that's why i never look at game i'm going to kill in the eyes because it lets them know what's coming yeah you know just duck your head away and stuff and because you transfer information to that animal because they know they see you and they realize what's going to happen it's just fascinating and the only way you can have those experiences is to be out there. You, you can't get that experience from a book. You can read it and people are going to hear about it and go, wow. Uh, I had an experience uh, during the rut this year in Wisconsin. I had a buck, 10 pointer chase an eight pointer, 10 feet from my feet. I was on the ground, couldn't shoot him. I had my crossbow, but they were moving way too fast. 
but they could care less that I was sitting there, you know, and I observed, I was an observer and I came away from that saying, Oh my goodness, the film would have gone viral. I don't film my hunt, but that film would have gone viral because it's just a 10 pointer chase an A pointer right at you. And they just broke away at 10 feet. <laughs> from me. But those are memories. Did I kill anything? No, but was I hunting? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. That's why, because I was telling before when I was a photographer, I mean, when I'm a photographer, I, I experienced that I had a different approach to the animal. So the stalking or maybe the approaching was different. I mean, get close to them. I think that my body or my body was moving totally different or the, I have to call that magnetic, electric field, whatever there is, exists probably that come off from my body was totally different. And I have to say that is a kind of strange. It's like I've experienced that a lot of time with roe deer. When, for example, you are completely concealed in the environment and the wind is good and the roe deer is coming to you. For example, when there is a group, we see the young one was stopped like ne next to you, but the adult one was stopped like two, three meters away. Even if nothing happened, even if you're completely behind the tree. And these things happened so many times to me. And then how you can explain that? I mean, every time I go back home and I say the window was good, I was completely behind the tree. I was no moving. And I have approved. Sometimes I do. I leave a camera there or there is a foam that is already turning in my hand. So and you say to yourself that how that is possible. And then it's really the interesting things because when you start to be in the outdoors continuously, I mean, spending a lot of time, you start to develop the, that kind of perspective. It's because why when I talk with some people, for example, that happened to me that was talking in the clinic, and I was hearing something like a small bird that came inside the roof of our structure in the clinic, and it was like t -t -t, the small feet are just jumping around on a metal thing. And I said, oh, did you hear that? And the person in front of me said, what? He said, did you hear that? And there's something on our head. And he said, no, I didn't hear anything. When I was thinking about myself about that, it's like most of the time you spend in the outdoors, you're going to develop those kind of senses. And it's incredible. I think it's the same thing about a deer. A deer just is born there in the forest. He stayed there all his life. He knows everything about the forest. So he can even perceive something behind a tree that he cannot see with his vision. We can with, with science today. We can understand how they perceive the noise, sound, whatever it is, vision. I don't think we can understand something more that is not material. It's not practical to just take it and you divide it. You understand what there is inside and what is this. What there is behind is impossible to understand. It's impossible. I've been doing martial arts for so many years when I was young. And I remember that reading some books about your Oriental philosophy. There are some stories about going back to the Middle Ages of Japan, whatever. There are some of uh, Bushido warriors that can't understand if they enter a house, if there was someone already waiting for them in just behind the door. And I've been always passionate about this culture. And I also done a little bit of meditation by myself. And I think there is this kind of, you can call Eastern, whatever it is, electric field, whatever it is, I don't know, but exist. And animals are the masters about that. Maybe we lost this a little bit with the evolution because of our brain. But I think some people that are in the outdoors completely, they start to feel like I can perceive these kind of things better the people that maybe are urban people. Mm, well said. Because you go back to the Chinese and read books like Shogun and the characters of those, and they gave evidence of shooting their eyes, shooting their bow, and killing the guy that's coming through their rice wall before they even saw him. Yeah. Their eyes were shut. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of legend about that because it's, good right. be, it's being used to create 
commercial view of that. But practicing martial art and being with some kind of guy that has a lot of experience, or they, you, know, you can call masters or sensei, whatever it is. But, and they can tell you that practicing in a way allows you to see things in a different way, or maybe see things that other people are not used to see. Yeah. Because I know the good hunters I know, they know where the game is and they understand what the game is about. And you got schooled by that roe deer barking behind you because he came to check you out because one, he knew something was there and you're soft breathing, you're not hard breathing, you're sleeping, you're out. What's up with that? Non-threat. And then you woke up and he goes, okay, bark to let you know that he knows that you're there. It's an interesting thing. And I welcome anybody that wants to continue this conversation with me, reach out to Bruce Hutchin at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. And if you have illustrations of that, reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook. I'd love to talk to you about that because the people, alpha hunters, call them what you want, people that hunt big bucks, as I do, do it differently than 99%. I had Dan Infelt and he on the show late last year, and he hunts by finding a killing tree. Say what? Yeah. He hunts public land, and he finds a killing tree. He doesn't find a buck. He finds a tree that he can kill a buck out of. Now, you have to go to the hunting beast and look up Dan, but I was mesmerized by his technique. And when he goes to a new area, he hasn't hunted, he hunts for the killing tree. Wrap around that, folks, and let me know how that works out. In the warm-up, Francesco, we talked about you wanted to ask me some questions. Oh, yeah. I'm really curious to see and even to hear about uh, from you. What is the thing that moved yourself to hunting in your life? The aspect that moved to, to change your, I mean, to put the kind of idea in your mind, say, wow, I want to start to be a hunter. It has to go back to grade school, and it has to go back to... My desire, I lived in the country, lived in a place called Foster Center, Rhode Island, and went to a real small school. And one of my buddies was a trapper, and he trapped stuff. And we talked back and forth. And then I said, hmm, I want to be a hunter. Now, I can't tell you Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, were magazines that I read, but I had an insatiable desire to become a hunter. And so one day I went out. We had white pines, and I went to the white pines. I took some breadcrumbs from the pantry. I took a rubber band, and I took heavy paper clip. And I spread out the breadcrumbs, and I sat down with my back to the tree, and I waited just to see what would show up. Well, what showed up were chickadees. And it took me a few times, but in the end of that time, that session, an hour or so, I had killed the chickadee. And I had killed something. And I was a young kid. I'm in grade school. And I go, I just took a life. I killed something. I didn't know what to do. So I said, I just thanked it. And then I buried it. And so where that came from, that desire has been in me since I've been a little kid. The next thing I killed were rabbits. And the next thing I really remember vividly is as a young boy, I had a, a single shot, 20 gauge. And you had to pull the hammer back to shoot it. Pull the hammer back, pull the trigger. Our, our little farm, our, our 80 acres, I was hunting grouse. And the way I hunted grouse, I didn't have a dog. So I looked where the wingtips were in the snow. Why? Because grouse die bomb into snow when it's really cold because it insulates them. And so I'm not the other predator that knows that. Owls know that. Foxes know that. And so I was just a predator. So I'm walking along and watching the ground and I see the wingtips. So I cocked the hammer back and out of the snow busts the Ralph grouse and, and I shot it and I went, oh my goodness, I did it. <laughs> it was just amazing. And I'm 10 years old, 12 years old. I did it. How did I do it? I read the sign, put myself in the right position. I was there. I was hunting. Sure. And then I pulled the gun up and I got ahead of it and pulled the trigger. And then I took it home, plucked it and ate it. So that was in, I was born in 1946, so we're talking first since, since six, seven, eight, so early 50s, so I killed my first game, and then I trout fished and all the other. 
but I've always been drawn to the wild side and I've been nine feet from a charging grizzly. I've been surrounded by seven wolves. The stories go on and on simply because I've hunted all over North America. But that was my passion. And where did it come from? I believe it's part of my DNA. Some people say, well, God put it in you. And I'm fine with that. But we are hunters. And very early on, I got in touch with that part of me. You so know. do you think that the reason that push you, this is the same question I ask us all different people because it's interesting, the reason that is because you try to prove something to yourself that you start to hunt or just is the reason is because you want to be part of the wilderness? I would say both. I was very successful in corporate America because I drove myself. Corporate America and sales was nothing but a hunt. You have a need. I have to find where you are. Then I have to find out what it's going to take for me to sell you, period. Yeah. Same thing as hunting. True. Okay. Then you go, I have to prove to myself. Yes, I have to push myself up that mountain. I have to, at 70 years old, climb a 14er while hunting, while looking for sheep. I had my long glass on and I had my binos with me. So I had 20 pounds of glass. I climbed a 14er just because I wanted to see the basin on the other side. And so I have all these, I'll just call them granolas, wonderful people. I just call them granolas or mountain baggers. They're climbing the peak and I'm sitting off to the side out of the way and glassing this basin. And the basin's about 12,000 feet. But I can see right down into it to see if it's any sheep there. So did I climb a 14 in a bag it? No, I climbed it to hunt. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Does that answer your question, Francesca? Oh, totally. It's actually what I can agree with that reason, because there is a part that you want to prove yourself if you are able, I think, maybe to survive or to be independent in an open environment like that. And there is even the other reason that you want to be part of it because you love it. And being a part of it is just like you concretize yourself, I think. Yeah. In my case, it even goes by because animals know that I'm not going to kill them. Yeah. When we made up, when those bucks came at me, a little six-pointer, he was less than 10 feet from me. He was just looking at me, but he knew I wasn't going to kill him. So yeah. he's just going, what is that? Because I was inside a tree, a dead tree that gets hollowed out, and I was inside that. And that was my hide and sitting on the ground. It's just interesting. The older you get, and I've been hunting over 53 years, that animals figure out that you're a threat or not a threat. And this year was a bigger thing than anything because I got Nebraska. I found out where a buck was living. He and his brother were living. And I watched the younger buck get up. I was 100 yards away, and he came within 22 yards of me, knowing that full well that I was there all the time. Yeah. No, he didn't scare. He didn't do anything. He got bored of me, you know, and just ate the alfalfa and went away. But you start having those situations, then you're getting attuned to the wilderness. And there's people that can live in the wilderness, are comfortable in the wilderness, and there's people that scare us. It scares the shit out of them. They can't handle the silence. I have some kind of stories about that also. I mean, of course, we don't bump out people. They're all lovers of wilderness. So that's normal. I mean, it's just. Our age, I mean, today is like that, the world. So we cannot even expect that everyone is loving the outdoors. It's totally normal. But yes, yeah, true is what you're saying. is uh, that there are so many people who cannot stand even one second in the wilderness. I don't know why, but it's a fact. What's your story? You said you get a couple of stories. You no, I mean, it. it's sometimes like for my work, we have some students that uh, in France is like that from college. They come. And they're going to spend one week to, to see how is the work. And maybe they're going to try to get into the vet industry. Because here, we're on the countryside. Sometimes, like, during a check of a cow or a horse, we can stop a little bit in the wilderness because maybe there's a little bit of free time. And they say, look, it gets, follow me. You're going to go in the forest. I want to just check the area. There is a good time of the day. I like it. And some students, they are like, why are we going there? Say, come on, guys, it's just spending a little bit of time. We are waiting for the next check, and there's a little bit, a couple of hours. We just 
chill out and, and having a little bit of snack and going to the forest, just a little walk. And it's impossible. I mean, they, they, they don't like it. I was just, no, we prefer we go back to the clinic and get a coffee. Wow. And what can you do? You don't like it. It's just not going to force people. But sometimes you have good experience as well. I have a student that started, I have one actually that started that when he was 14 and he was so passionate about what was seeing with me and he said, look, I'm, can I come even the next year? And I say, oh, totally. And he started to come year after year, year after year. Now he's starting back and he followed me in some of my hunt and adventures. He's now he's tried to learn about photography, want to be a photographer. And some of the pictures that on our Instagram profile were made by him. So that's a huge satisfaction. You see, someone loves what you exactly what you love and want to follow your path. That's amazing. When it happens, I mean, it doesn't happen there every time. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't happen every time. It will happen every time. You will be bored after a while. And yeah, I was really happy about that. Really, really happy. Hey, folks. Bruce Hutchin, host of Whitetail Rendezvous. Hey, I'm pleased to announce that Buckwell Coffee is continuing their sponsorship for 2019. What's so special about Buckwell Coffee? Well, a gazillion people every day go to Starbucks and buy coffee. Well, I'll ship it to your house. Yes, I'll ship light, medium, or dark roast, ground or bean, right to your house. It's real simple. Just go to whitetailrendezvous.com forward slash shop, pick out what roast you want, and we'll ship it out. Take a look at Buckwild Coffee, the finest roast in the West. Well, finest roast around the campfire, finest roast around your kitchen table. It's just flat out the finest roast you can get today. Order some at whitetailrendezvous.com forward slash shop. What's your one big thing that you know today about hunting? that just a couple of years ago, you said, man, I wish I knew that then because I would have been more successful hunting chamois or roe deer or whatever. I think that I will try because I've been hunting roe deer, especially and mostly with precision rifle. And I always being passionate about the shooting bows. So I was shooting traditional bows from Mongolia because I love horseback archery. So I went to Mongolia to try to find the last artisan that's still doing the laminated bows, the horns and wood. And I found one and I discovered just seven. There are remaining seven artisans in all Mongolia that can still do a traditional bow. So I found one and he made a couple for me. And then... I was starting just by myself because here in the hair, no one was hunting with a bow. And then I remember I got my first bow it was a bow tag. I don't remember which one, but, and then after I killed a couple of small games like a pheasant and rabbit, and then I stopped because it was difficult, it was frustrating. It didn't, it didn't, I didn't improve at all. So after so many years, like in 2017, I started again to practice with a good compound. And I wish I would started that a lot early because I love that type of hunt. That type of hunt is not so well diffused here. I mean, there's not so many people that are doing that in France. So it's difficult to find a tag for that type of hunt because here in my hair, it's just all about driven hunts. But I love the kind of, there's the silent, there's the individual chains, there's fine the killing tree, as you said, is fascinating. I love that type of I wish I would start it a lot before because it's physical. It to be shaped. You have to train a lot. This is the things I really like. You have to be strict about your improvement. I mean, you just, with the bow, I'm sure 100%, you can't just say, okay, it's perfect. And then you just wait when you're going to hunt. No, you have to practice every day. Every day, if it's possible, but at least a lot. I mean, you have to, Reserve some days of your week just doing some reps. And that's really important. doesn't matter what you feel too proud about you. It's, something's going to happen in the wild. It's going to be like your glove a little bit too big, too thick. Maybe your posture is not easy because you are in the forest. You cannot choose how your feet is going to be there. Your animal is starting to come so fast at 20 yards and maybe it's moving a quarter away. So that's really the hunt that I like. And thank you for that. Do you have any last comments for the listeners here in North America? I think, guys, that 
from a European perspective, it's like you guys have one of the most beautiful hunt out there. Your land is beautiful and it's really nice to see that there are people they are so passionate about the hunt like you, like this project, like this podcast, and is continuing to do this type of work and this project is bringing the hunt to the good level. And I said before, because the critics are a lot, there's a lot of people that don't understand the effort and that we put our life into it. It's not a hobby. It's not something you do just the weekend. A, there is a lot of devotion. There's a, a lot of responsibility, actually. Well, can I see, I mean, what I've seen on Instagram, on this kind of social, you guys are doing good work. And it's amazing when we watch your videos, when we, we listen to your podcast. It's happy to from Europe to see uh, what is happening over there. Thank you so much for that, Francesco. And, and with that, we're going to wrap this edition of Whitetail Rendezvous Vits Europe, Visits Europe. So, Francesco, I look forward to having you on again. I'd love to have any members of your team on. As a friend told me a long time ago, that's a wrap. Time for a nap. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.